When I was working as a financial advisor, I lived in the city of San Francisco, and uh, I would always tell clients, uh, people could probably tell I've got a large humorous streak in me, and this always <laughs> carried over into my professional career, uh, but I would tell clients, I'll expect that you are always going to be slightly disappointed with me. And they would usually look at me a little bit funny and I would follow up and say, hey, look, if the market's down 20%, we're only going to be down 10%. And while your neighbor is jumping off his roof after setting himself on fire because he's down 50%, uh, you're going to be slightly disappointed uh, at negative 10%. Um, now, if the market goes up plus 30 and your next door neighbor is running around in his backyard showering himself with dollar bills, well, you're also going to be slightly disappointed because we're probably only going to be up 15 or 20%. So my bottom line there was that I was trying to set expectations for my clients that, hey, look, the portfolio that we're trying to build is going to be lower volatility. And that is our main focus is reducing risk. And so my very first big client uh, at my first annual review actually was on the negative 10% side. This was uh, probably the middle of 2002, maybe spring of 2002, dot com, you know, burst. And I was taking the train over to downtown Oakland. That's where my, my client's office was. And we met on Saturdays. He really liked the fact that I could meet with him and his wife on Saturdays. His wife was a high school principal. So during the week, she wasn't available. And San Francisco's never terribly hot, but I was sweating from the minute I left my house because I had this big account. You know, and while 10% wasn't a giant loss in percentage terms, because the account was big for me as a 28-year-old at the time, this was a huge amount of money I had lost uh, for this client. And so I'm sweating... I'm sweating as we go across the, the bay over to Oakland. I get to the office building. The security guard lets me in up to the office, and we sit down at their conference table in his, in his office. And, and his first words to me when I showed him what his portfolio had done over the year was, well, Dan, you did tell me that I was going to be slightly disappointed, and you're right, my neighbor's down 25%, so this is great. <laughs> so, with that, we are going to jump into Valuability, episode number five, Delivering Value, Client Service with a Purpose. And that story just illustrates a couple of things. A, you know, the need for having a process, right? I had a, a distinct process for explaining to my clients how things were going to go in the future and then and then it worked um, they 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 remembered that and when we got to that first review um, they were able to to put those pieces together and you know get to the place that that I wanted them to be um, welcome to the valuability podcast uh, Valuability Podcast is for financial advisors, business owners, and anyone interested in financial planning, business, leadership, and personal development. My name is Danforth Fleek. I was a financial advisor, obviously, after that story, and product wholesaler for over 20 years. I'm joined each week by my longtime friend, Philip Simonson. Philip, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Dan. Doing very well. Excellent. Uh, tell them a little bit about your background. Well, my background, been in the business nearly 40 years, been an advisor, been uh, a field leader, Sat on, uh, had the great fortune and very grateful to have uh, set up a company, financial planning company over in England, uh, supposed to be their year, ended up five years for American Express, 
came back. Uh, I worked with uh, and sat on the operating committee of ING Advisors Network, and where we had 8,000 advisors and set up their practice management business development uh, unit, where our key role was to help our uh, advisors become more productive and really truly manage these three things for anyone to have a successful business or practice. It must consist, you know, one must be able to manage net income, then manage processes, and then manage and lead others. So today we're going to be talking about, uh, as Dan said, delivering value, and we had to deliver value to our end client, the advisor there. So with that, you know, that's really me, Dan. Excellent. You can find our podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn. We're on a number of platforms. You can also find us on our YouTube channel, Search Value-Ability on YouTube, and you can find our channel there. Or you can find us at value-ability.com. Click on the Episodes tab, and we upload all of our episodes directly to our website. While you're there, sign up for our mailing list. Uh, value-ability.com click on the contact us tab while you're there and sign up for that mailing list you can also follow us on twitter and instagram at value underscore ability the instagram account is of special interest because that is where we put any visuals that we use Uh, i don't think we have any visuals for this week but uh, keep your eyes peeled there for visuals in uh, the episodes that we do Uh, as always Please do not look at our website or social media accounts if you are driving. And wherever you find us, like, review, subscribe, share the mantra of podcasters everywhere. So with that, let's jump into the main topic, delivering value, client service with a purpose. So you mentioned the three things, uh, Philip. Uh, of those three things, which, which is the the most important one from a value standpoint, would you say? Mm. You know, uh, from delivering a, a value and, and service, is, it's going to be managing uh, your client service processes. And right. uh, we'll talk, you know, that's a great lead in, Dan. And, and the other thing I would, I'll just bring up here, you had mentioned in your intro, your number one client, and he remembered your words. And that's, uh, I think that's very important for all of us to uh, remember. You know, words do have purpose, and uh, use them uh, use them well because the those people that you're serving they will remember them. Some of them might get also what you're saying right then and there, but it might be a month down the road. Uh, uh, could be a year down the road, but you you can better believe it. It uh, if you don't use them well, it can and and also be consistent with uh, your words with your behavior. It'll come back to bite you. And one of the great orators. Uh, of last century, Martin Luther King, and talking about words. One of my favorite quotes to help set this whole stage up, he says, to become great is not seeking out fame. It is in the service to others that will make, uh, makes one truly great. So this is all about what we've, you know, also you know, delivering value and it's client service with purpose. And what I've learned here uh, from this is that in delivering this service uh, with purpose, one of the things that you must do is open yourself up to be vulnerable. And if you're if you demonstrate to your clients that you are vulnerable, they're going to be more relaxed. They're also going to know that you do not have hidden agendas. Because uh, if you go in with uh, this meeting is all about you and maybe you're able to, you know, uh, sell another product they're eventually gonna if they're not immediately snuff that uh, sniff that out or snuff that out they certainly you they will by the second time you have one of these uh, actual reviews so i learned this from a gentleman named doug carter doug was uh, the president of tony robbins organization not the first one the second one but uh Doug and I did some consulting work at met uh it was at met life late night in mean, late 90s early 2000 and he said Here's the difference between clients and customers. A client thinks so highly of you, they're willing to add you in as a line item in their budget. And, you know, 
there's the net income piece. If you're eventually building your practice, you want to create recurring revenue. And you want to make sure it's, you know, that recurring revenue stays consistent and it becomes predictable. Versus, you know, now another, you know, another way in which you, you know, define a client here too is, you know, they're willing to, uh, they buy and purchase multiple products from you. They also refer you to others. Versus a customer that you generally, and they buy one product and you do not see them again. The next thing I want to talk to you a little bit about is, uh, I think it just helps center this whole conversation, is uh, there's some client service facts. And there's one particular here, you know, I'm going to go through maybe three or four of them. But dissatisfied clients tell an average of 10 other people about their bad experience, 12% will tell 20 people. So that bad news will travel a lot further than good news. You know, if it was you know, satisfied clients, you'll tell maybe three to four. Yeah, it, it just triggered something in my mind. Um, I used to think of of that from the standpoint of like two two lines that overlap, right? You've got your your satisfied customers, the line on the top, right, and then your dissatisfied customers, the line on the bottom, and they where they overlap is in the middle, right? And so in that middle section, those are the people that are neither satisfied enough with you to tell you, nor are they dissatisfied enough with you to tell you, right? So it's the it's the people at the ends that right. speak up, right? They have to be either super satisfied with you or they have to be super dissatisfied with you. But when you sit down and look at those numbers, if you do a, you know, a client, uh, a client survey, you typically find that the the numbers in the middle aren't necessarily proportional, right? Um, the the line on the bottom may be skewed one way or another, so you may have, you know, overall more people that are dissatisfied with you, but it's just that some of a good majority of them aren't telling you that because they aren't super dissatisfied with you, right? And you really don't know that until you go in and and try and find that out, right? Right, and figure out that. Uh, so it just popped into my mind thinking about that. That remember, there's it's like an iceberg. Oh, <laughs> like however many well, people there are that are saying uh, either positive or negative things about you. Um, remember there's more people that feel that way <laughs> hidden below the surface. Well, here's another fact. And this, these are some facts, 12 facts that comes from Madison and associates. Um, and if, if those clients in the middle, Dan, as you just referenced, if 20 clients are dissatisfied with your service, 19 won't tell you. And 17 of the 20, 20 will take their business elsewhere. And that's not surprising to me because we really truly are a conflict avoidance society. We'll do everything we can do to avoid pain. Right. So that's not surprising. And I think the key thing, and again, it does not just for individual advisors here, but anyone in a service or retail business or manufacturing, it, your studies will show, and I'll, you know, it costs 10 times more to attract a new client than to keep an existing one. And you think about it, you know, okay, costs money to put together your marketing program and generate, you know, generate leads, whether or not it's through seminars, workshops, etc. Then you got to, you got to follow up, you got to call them. Then, geez, you, you know, you got to have a, you know, I first initial meeting with them to determine, you know, when, if you can help them out. Secondly, more importantly, it's for them to determine whether or not there's enough perceived value to enter into a long-term relationship with you. Well, that's like lens crafter in and out in about an hour. And hopefully you're not, you know, doing any windshield time. Uh, they're coming now to your office. But if they say yes to that, then you got to, you know, I'm just going to stay with the planning process here. You got to, you got to put together their plan. That could be anywhere from two to four hours. Then you got to meet with them again to present the plan and lay out your recommendations. By the time you're done, it you probably you've got anywhere from five to seven to maybe ten hours, depending on the complexity of the client, before you even get right. uh, agreement that they're going to become a client of yours. Yeah, no doubt. I During my career as a wholesaler, I saw this time and time again where uh, an advisor would bring on a junior rep 
and you know give them the accounts that the senior rep thought were you know of lesser value right, right. it was the bottom section of their of their book of business uh the people they didn't have super strong relationships the accounts that only had one you know one product or they got them super early in their career and they just never really developed into a client and time and time again I would see these newer advisors coming in and just through the process of reaching out and touching base with these people would find a, a rollover or, you know, money in motion and you know, uh, would always hear the senior rep griping. About, oh, gee, I didn't find that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that's so true. And, and, and I guess, you know, I'll go back to that 10 times more. Uh, here's the other thing. Once you've got them as a client and you spent all that time up front, you've established their trust. And once you have their trust, details don't matter. But if you do, do not have their trust, all the details in the world are not going to help you out. And if you've laid that plan down for them, then when you're doing the reviews, they now get the whole picture. And though that plan is also based upon their numbers, not yours. You know, and, and they, they understand why they need what they need. And it doesn't take as much time in your explanation because you've, they've, they've got a track to run on. So you know, it does take uh, more time up front, but boy, make sure once you have them, you keep them. And uh, we're going to talk more about that. Uh, and I, here's another one I want to just, and then we'll move on to the next subject matter I want to. 78% of your dissatisfied clients will become loyal clients again if their complaints are handled well and quickly. So one of wow. the key things, when you've got a client complaint and they're not satisfied, it's gonna, you know, you're, it's gonna be painful, but you gotta be vulnerable here, and you gotta open up and admit if you've made the mistake. This is a country of second chances. We will, we will give people another chance, but it's got to be handled well. And a couple of things, you know, one of the phrases I used to use: if you're the CEO of this company, what would you do if, in your situation, to make this right? Now it's, you're touching the heart again. You're letting them tell you what they're going to need, and then you can then start managing expectations. But also, you know, if you're inheriting someone else's problem here, but you want to keep this account, well, look, the line I used to, you know, have used in the past is I can't go back and rewrite the beginning here. That's what's done is done. However, what I am asking for is the opportunity to start writing the ending here with you. And I'm just looking for that second chance. And most people will give it to you, but you've got to be open and you've got to be uh, uh, vulnerable. Yeah, that's interesting. Another thing popped into my mind, I, I recall a statistic, and I, I can't remember the specific number, but it was it was an extraordinarily high number, I, I, I recall, uh, as to how many financial professionals on average uh, clients have. And it was somewhere in the range of like three to five, somewhere in there that, you know, they've got, you know, maybe a, a, a independent financial advisor, financial planner. They may have a, a, an account through the bank or credit oh, union where mm -hmm. they've got, you know, some investment that they bought there. Uh, they might have an accountant that also does, you know, investments that's done a piece here. And so... You know, trying to become that primary advisor and having that you know, value process is going to differentiate you and, and really pull those assets in as well. Yes, absolutely. And, and starting with the planning process uh, is, is key. And you know, so obtaining client loyalty, as you just said, Dan, and that value proposition, let's talk a little bit about that. And value proposition, that equals quality plus service plus price. Now, for advisors here, quality is uh, that's uh, perf that's going to be the quality of your advice and your performance of your of your investments, as defined by the client. Now, service here is going to be that's uh, I'd look at that as providing ongoing communication regarding you know your financial planning strategies, uh, and and the goal uh, achievement towards those. 
uh, to, you know, retirement goal or you know, education of your children. And these will also be often defined by the client. And then there's price, within, and price is within reason defined by the client. And price only becomes an issue in absence of value. And I'm going to repeat that. Price only becomes an issue in absence of value. Now, the common theme here that you probably picked up on, it's defined by the client. So Dan kicked off and he, you know, at, at, with his story here about, uh, you know, setting expectations with clients. So we will always like to give you some tidbits, uh, you know, in our in our podcast. That's why you know creating significance is you know establishing meaningful relationship and work here. And, and one of the things that we truly believe in, in 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 individual development that you know you hire talent, you you develop skills, and you teach decision making. So with that in mind, in in around skills here and. One skill, if there's anything I would ask you to take away from today, put this question into your initial interview. And you can, whether it's retail or it's in the client service um, or manufacturing, but it's got to be a question something like this. And it, it, and it goes, now, Mr. and Mrs. Client, if we're sitting down three years from today and you said we've had a successful relationship, what must occur in order for that to happen? Now, I'm going to repeat that. If we're, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Client, or if you're taking an interview with the boss, it's not a bad question to ask your boss. You know, and I told this to all my kids, you know, they're interviewing children when they were out of college and throwing for their first job. Look, they're interviewing you. At the end, you need to interview, you know, it's okay for you to interview them. And one of the things, you know, to determine to manage expectations to, and to figure out whether or not you think you can succeed in this job, ask this question. Again, if you're sitting down three years from today and you said we've had a successful relationship, what must happen in order for that to occur? The worst thing that can happen is they're going to look at, what do you mean? Well, just what Dan said at the very beginning, let's talk about how I, you know, around performance. One of the things by working with me, I'm, and and I work with my clients to prepare for the certainty of uncertainty. What I mean by that, you can be certain we're going to hit a down market. When it happens, uh, the way we're going to, you know, my investment philosophy, figuring out what your risk tolerance is, utilizing the asset allocation and, and building and structuring a portfolio based upon that. My role and key role is to make sure when we hit those markets that your loss is not as great as what most people in, in, interpret the markets as, the Dow. All they hear about from the pundits is the Dow. Well, we, you know, the way you've set up your client, as you mentioned earlier, Dan, You've got them in different uh, buckets of uh, asset classes, and you've reduced the risk. Yeah, that's the thing that I probably didn't do correctly was I didn't ask that question. I kind of just laid down, hey, this is the way I build my portfolios. Now, with that client, it happened to resonate, right? and and it worked, but you also run the risk um, of – you know, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. You're setting the expectations. And we actually mentioned this in a previous episode about, hey, you might be setting expectations that they have no interest in um, or focusing on the wrong things. By starting with that you know, question, you're eliciting from them what they want Correct. and focusing in each specific client on those things that are important to them. Now, you know, many ad- advisors tend to gravitate towards similar clients, clients that have similar likes and dislikes to them. Um, as you build your practice, you can then tailor that. I actually worked with a, a financial advisor that even as he was just first starting out, he made a conscious decision that he was just not going to work with anyone under the age of 50. And he felt like that you know, 50 plus age range was his target market. He wanted to focus on retirement planning and income planning. And he just stuck to his guns on that. Now, that was highly unusual. And you know, most advisors starting out are going to you know, take 
we take any clients, right? I remember just thinking, I'll take anyone. Whoever walks through the door, I would tell my, uh, I was located in a, in a financial institution, in a bank. I would tell the tellers that all the time. I would say, if someone comes in asking for fried chicken, send them to me. <laughs> I'd sell dead dog something if I could. <laughs> right. Like, and the bottom line was, I, I would tell them where they could buy fried chicken and then also find out if they wanted help with their finances. <laughs> A couple things there too, though, Dan, and I'm going to you raise and I want to go back to. Uh, when you ask that question, you know, if we're sitting down three years from today and you said, and you know, what must happen in order for that, for us to, for you to say we've had a successful relationship, you are absolutely right. You're, this is where you're managing expectations. One, maybe to what your ideal client criteria is. And then you can define that to the client. You know, mine is, look, I want my, you know, so, after, but first, it's, it's just as you said, it's first finding out what their expectations are. And to help you determine, you know, to steer this, well, you've got them, you know, we talked about them already, around quality. Quality, remember, is, is, is around advice and it's around performance of investments. When we kick this thing off, Dan talked about 15, 20% overall rate of return. Well, he said 2002, the dot, bot, you know, the dot com stuff. I'll tell you what, after 2002, 2001, when all that happened, uh, the next 20 years, we didn't get uh, like the 90s, the 15, 20%. So it's about managing expectations around return during those time periods. They were running high when Dan was, and I were selling back in the, you know, the 90s and the early 2000s. But it, it's quieted down now. But if you've got a client now, today wants, I expect you to get me 12, 15% time out. That's time out right now, right? Because once you find out I can't do that, all you're all I'm, you're gonna re, I'm, what I'm gonna realize and what you're gonna realize is I'm just renting your money. Yeah, that's a great point. I kind of pulled those numbers out of the air. Um, like my my point with that was if uh, if the if the market does X, right. we're going to do less than X. We're gonna be less volatile than the market. Yep. Um, so yeah, and back then we were. Like like you said, we were seeing 25, 30% oh, gains, right? Phenomenal. Right. But then you can, again, you can then manage around service. So what do you think, Mr. and Mrs. Client, around service? Now, if they become an advisory client of yours, you know at, at a minimum you have to offer them. You have to offer them an annual review. It's up to them whether or not they decide to. But you've got to be able to uh, you know, find out what, you know, how frequently do they want to meet. And then in regard to that, you know, when we are meeting, radical concept, again, ask them, you know, what it is they want as outcomes from that meeting. By asking them what they want, you're going to have a better chance of achieving what it is they want for themselves. And a great example of that, before you even, you know, before the prior to the meeting, and this is, I don't want to get, you know, is just ask them, look, we have an upcoming meeting. What are the one or two outcomes you want from this meeting here uh, that we have upcoming in the review. So at the end of that meeting, you can say, this has been uh, time well spent, or it's been a successful meeting. If you're good at what you're doing, you can back into anything. So that, you know, manager, you know, talk about service expectations and then pricing. You got to talk about pricing as well. The one thing that you cannot do in this value proposition, you can't compete on all three. Right. It's just not going to happen. So pricing, if it's, you know, you want a pricing model, well, then you know you got to compete against a Vanguard. What are they, you know, advisory fees now? 35 basis points are, are Schwab in, in, in TD Ameritrade. They compete on pricing. It's one of their keys. So you, as an advisor, you know, you're, you know, you're quality and service, and it's always pricing uh, within reason. And again, price only becomes an issue in absence of value. So you've got to work with the client in defining that. And that's a whole other subject matter when we can talk about pricing and how you can price out today in the advisory model. Um, but those are, those are some key things I just wanted to share with you around that value proposition, quality of service. Now, evaluating the value proposition Clients typically, you know, Dan and I were talking about this before we kicked this uh, whole session off. Clients generally will evaluate uh, the value proposition on three levels. 
There's the basic. Those are the things that you need just to be able to keep your doors open. There's the niceties, the things that you're providing them. And then there's the unanticipated, things that they didn't even know you were offering. Now, what you have to be careful of here, and you got to stay in, you know, informed, you know, uh, current with your clients, let's put it that way. And, you know, and it's always good to do some surveys with them. But asking them, because uh, those unanticipated things that you're providing will become the basic over time. But Dan, you know, when we, uh, we first started off, you know, some of the unanticipated was, uh, you know, providing asset allocation, providing financial planning. It was before it was just selling mutual funds, selling annuities and selling a product. You didn't actually do it. You know, a lot of people didn't do planning and they didn't right. have the asset allocation. Then, you know, oh, okay, if I'm going to go that route and I'm going to start charging an advisory fee, well, I better, you know, I'm going to offer you all bridge and I'm going to get you to be able to produce all these different reports and be able to add in, and depending on your broker dealer, but for an IRA today, it doesn't, you know, you can add in below the line and above the line items. Then we said, right. geez, you know, a lot of advisors I remember working with, well, you, you know, my advisor, um, I have online access and I've had it for over 20 some years with Allbridge. That scared a lot of advisors. I don't want my client to be able to see what their accounts are doing and their performance. Absolutely. That was really the big one, right? I, I remember going through that transition and, and still today I'm even working with clients that, that are still lagging on that side where that's a, a key interest for them is that their, their website's not fully developed. They don't have a client portal. So that would certainly be one of the, you know, those unanticipated things. Um, another one that's been out there over these last couple of years is, you know, the ability to y use some kind of, you know, uh, 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 robo advice, right. right? And adding that to platforms and many broker dealers have explored ways of, of adding that as a, uh, you know, a subset of a financial advisor's um, uh, services. And uh, yeah, it's just more and more and more. And I would say now even uh, probably it's going to be uh, video conferencing capabilities. Oh, well, particularly now Zoom, <laughs> it's going to be, that's going to be a basic now. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to bring this point home around pricing. So this is, my advisor's very good at this. And I think a lot of advisors are not personally. And that is this, them being able to uh, unselfishly be able to talk about without and getting your ego in, in the way and your, you know, your self-worth about how you're adding value to them. So, you know, if you're charging 1%, 1% on a million, well, what is that, Dan? Real quickly, 10 grand, right? Double check. That's how much you're paying yep. in advisory fees. Well, my advisor reminds me how much he has saved me in different tax strategies, uh, estate tax planning, the thousands that he saved me. Absolutely. Right? And so that 10,000 becomes, it doesn't become a big, uh, you know, you, you, from a emotional uh, biases which we have if you anchor that 10,000 then you got to overcome it and be able to demonstrate your value and you know they're doing the math so the other thing is what I told clients just uh, that I'm working with in, in coaching advisors this week just as Dan said look percentage wise most clients don't get it what they do get is loss so look the Dow Jones you had a million the Dow Jones on, on its, you know, was on, down 32%, might have went a little bit more in this last uh, panic of selling. So you lost 320000 Now, the way I structured your portfolio, we were down 15%. That means we were only down 150000 They will connect better with the actual dollar amount than they will your percentages. Right, that goes back to my initial story where in my mind I was thinking about that and it was my first you know seven figure account yep. and that loss was you know six figures and I just was sweating huge bullets because of it <laughs> yeah yeah there's a great story and and it brings home that you know to obtain client loyalty 
you got to gain their loyalty by, you know, you have to earn it by over delivering on your value proposition. And again, it consists of those three things. Pricing, product, that's not, you know, that should not be an issue with you. And I'm going to something, you know, we'll talk about that one real quick. You're, most of you out there, you're independent. So, you know, you can go out and shop the best of the best. Uh, and then again, it's service. But the client defines those. That's the key denominator there. So the I guess the couple of last things to wrap up on here then, Dan, with this is uh, if any of you are out there who are listening are advisors, I'm going to do a shameless plug. Here we go, Dan. And you know, Dan and I work with a lot of advisors, and we put you know, and again to run a successful practice or a business, you've got to manage these three things as we started talking uh, at the very beginning of this. You got to manage net income, you got to manage processes, and then you've got to man, you know, you know, manage and lead people. Around the processes, we have a complete client review manual with pre-appointment checklists, you know, uh, emails, you know, disaster recovery right now. If you have another one of these crises, you know, steps that you should be putting in place so you can respond accordingly. We've got it set up with post, uh, uh, inter- you know, post interview client service checklists, different tools you can use to get yourself ready for um, a client review. Plus, you, you know, one of the tools, if the SEC, if you're managing over 70, you know, maybe 50 million today, it used to be 100, then it was 75. If you're managing over that, you're going to get audited by the SEC at some point. The question is just when. And when they do, one of the big questions they're going to ask is, you got to be able to demonstrate to me how you're earning that fee. So you better have some tools in place to be able to show them. And then what we've got, uh, we, and, and we put together whether or not you use Redtail, Salesforce, but also how to code your clients to make sure at a minimum there's four touches a year. And we, when, we, when we produce items here, uh, one of the things we do is we, we know there's no silver bullet. So we got to you know, meet you where you are, and you're going to define what service looks like, quality looks like, and pricing as well. We will be working with you on that. But ultimately, you know, we'll have something that's 80% there. Then you got to make it yours. And with that, Dan, that's, you know, that's really the end of my piece here on uh, this client service with purpose. And I, I will just finish it with this, uh, what Dan and I have as one of our, ties into one of the you know, really Martin Luther King, King quote, one of our guiding principles and what we believe in. Success are those things that one does for oneself and it dies with a person. Significance are those things that one does for others, and it lives on after you're gone. Absolutely. So if you have interest in learning more about the client review manual and processes that we have, reach out to us on our website, value-ability.com. Go to the Contact Us tab, and uh, you can use the form there to uh, submit a uh, essentially sends an email to us so just uh, send us your information let us know that you're interested and we will get back in touch with you so moving on to our article for this week um, is uh, why advisors must treat social security as vital to retirement income um, so this covers a report uh Uh, Cerule Edge, U.S. Retirement Edition, said that while Social Security is a vital source of income in retirement, investors are too quick to discount it. Only 18% of active 401k participants anticipate that Social Security will represent their primary source of retirement income. Yet Social Security comprises the largest portion of income for retired households with less than $2 million in investable assets, more than defined benefit and contribution distributions combined. Now, I picked out this article because I think this is a little bit is a nest that our industry has built. You know, back when I was getting into the industry, uh, it was not unusual to hear advisors just completely discounting Social Security, just saying, oh, well, we're just going to pretend it's not going to be there and let's run your financial plan without Social Security being there. Now, that was 
pretty self-serving in a lot of ways because mm. what happens when you remove you know, the average social security check in America is twelve hundred dollars. That's you know fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars a year. What happens when you remove that amount of income out of their retirement income plan? Well, it gigantically increases the amount that you have to save, right? Correct. <laughs> so it was a, a little bit of a way to get clients to focus harder on saving. And I don't think it was done with bad intentions, mm -hmm. but I think this article is pointing out that it has created this instinct where even still today, people will say it's not going to be there. It's not going to be there. It's not going to be there. Um, and look, it has certainly has challenges and we will cover that in more detail going forward in a, in a different episode. But especially for people 50 to 55 plus, mm. um, the program has never been changed for anybody over the age of 45. So I would always tell people when doing seminars, I did probably over 300 seminars on Social Security when I was wholesaling. The idea that politicians would get away with changing it for people that are within 10 to 20 years of retirement is, I mean, politically, the backlash would be just atrocious. Nobody, I mean, they call Social Security in Washington the third rail of politics. You know, <laughs> touch it and die, right? It's going to electrocute you to death. So um, I just think it, I, I wanted to point this out because I, it, it is such an important part uh, if you haven't taking the time to learn the ins and outs of Social Security. It's a huge benefit. Everybody has questions about it. Everybody has misconceptions about it. Uh, as I mentioned, we will cover it in a future episode. Um, but you know, learning how to build that into an income plan is vitally important. And obviously, we have work to do. Only 18% of people think that it's going to be their primary source of income when over a third of people on Social Security, it is their only source of income. For one third of beneficiaries, people on Social Security, it is their only source of income in retirement. So just super, super vital. And I wanted to point that out with that. Any thoughts? No, I and you're, I know you're the expert on the Social Security. And, and <laughs> so I'm, you know, I, I just completely agree with you it's, and I know this statistic as well the average American who is re, uh, income in retirement is 49,000 so as Dan just mentioned if the average Social Security is 1200 I think that's 14,400 and I know you know and they've got a partner or spouse the, you add theirs in the spouses they, you know they can take their full amount or half if let's just say they take, and it's actually a little less than half you've taught me than the 14.4 uh, that that spouse could receive. Well, if you just do you know half of that, let's say it's six grand, you're at 20,000 and they've got 49,000 coming in. That's a big chunk, as you're saying. And they, you cannot chunk. ignore it. Uh, right. There's just no way. It's got to be put in there, and this is where you got to just educate them. It will be there. Uh, might not be there in the full form, but we've got a plan for it. Let's put it in, and then let's work backwards from there, and 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 get them get them to uh, stay stay focused on retirement. Now, that's a great point. The you know even uh, for the last decade or so, they've been putting on the front of the Social Security statements. Hey, if nothing changes by I think it was tw mid twenty thirties. Uh, they were going to have to reduce all benefits to a certain amount, and that number was in the hovers around the seventy to right. seventy five percent range. So you know that's really worst case scenario, not the zero that that for a long time we we looked at as an industry. So so just wanted to throw that article in there real quick and kind of put a teaser for that topic. Mm -hmm. uh, as we mentioned, there will be more coming up there. And that actually leads into our question section for the day. Question one, is Social Security part of the national debt? Now, this is a super interesting question because um, 
it is related to the national debt. You know, you will often hear this um, kicked around uh, politically by either side. Uh, you know, if it's a, a, a right leaning person, they will say, you know, X left you know, Democratic president rated Social Security. And if it's a, a left leaning person, they'll say ex Republican uh, president rated Social Security. The, the reality of it is, is that the trust fund is invested in U.S. treasuries. So it, it is not just a standing obligation of the government. That's a, 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 a totally different uh, a, a totally different concept. It's not just like a unfunded um, uh, pension plan where the company is saying, hey, we promise to pay this out of future profits. That would essentially be what having it as part of just the general national debt would be. Mm -hmm. The trust fund is separate. And actually, there's an interesting story. I worked with a lot of the public affairs specialists in um uh, that work for Social Security to get out there and help people, um, you know, spread the word about benefits and how they work. And one of them told me a story that over the years they were keeping all of the bonds that the Social Security Trust Fund was buying in book form. They just literally were keeping track of, hey, we own all these bonds. So uh, eventually, at some point, they came. Uh, it got to be a such a big number that someone at the Social Security Administration thought, you know what, we should probably have actual physical bonds <laughs> for this. <laughs> and so they they got the Treasury to print up bonds. And so I, I believe it was somewhere in, I can't remember what state he said, it was somewhere like West Virginia, Kentucky, that, that area, there was a Social Security office that had, you know, X billion dollars worth of U.S. government bonds just in a file cabinet. Right. That's exactly right. <laughs> but, and they weren't negotiable. Like, you couldn't go and steal them. It's not like Fort Knox, but uh, it just always cracked me up the idea that there was this, uh, this file cabinet somewhere with all of the, the bonds that, uh, uh, that, that is, uh, uh, the Social Security Trust Fund is comprised of. So, yes, it, now my opposite point there for people always was because people would say, well, that's no different. You're just buying into the national debt by buying bonds. Like, well, but what else would you have them do with that money? Like if you had them, if they just took the cash and buried it in a vault in Colorado, everyone would be furious that they weren't earning any money on, uh, on that trust fund. So the you know, U.S. government bonds are still considered the only risk-free investment in the world, and uh, it, they are repaid over time, and then they cycle into new bonds. And now, actually, we are starting to pay out more in benefits than we take in each month. So they are actually cashing in those bonds and using them to pay benefits, and those benefits are being paid. So no, it is not directly a part of the national debt, but uh, those assets are used to purchase U.S. government securities. Uh, so that leads on to our second question, and I'll toss this one to you, Philip. What is your biggest pet peeve in the financial planning industry? Why well, pet peeves, things that irritate you. Pretty simple for me. Comes down to greed. You know, stupid is optional. And with a lot of advisors, uh, Dan, you've had to witness it. You've participated uh, with me in this uh, task. I've had to let more people go because they didn't comply with compliance and the reason they didn't comply with compliance is because they got greedy yep. and uh, look this you know, best thing you can do in this industry and from a marketing standpoint is market your morals and uh, again uh, it's kind of that self-worth uh, you know we started off with Martin Luther King if it's all about you, it's not going to end up well. That's the bottom line. Yeah, I would say m my biggest pet peeve is the gap between the image that a person portrays and the actual value that they deliver, right? If you 
saying you are a financial advisor or a financial planner, there are very concrete things that you should be doing. You should be talking about life insurance oh, and protecting great point. the clients. You should be talking about education funding. You should be talking about retirement planning and income planning. Now, clients may turn those down, uh, but you should be at least offering them. And I, I can't tell you the number of advisors whose offices I've walked into where I saw something out there in their office that indicated that they offered some form of you know protection life insurance protection product and in the time that I work with them I found out that it comprised you know less than one percent of their overall you know income uh, was those types of right. products now a lot of those products don't pay a ton but you know, especially term products but still it, it, it's just that gap it doesn't right? matter it, dan i'm you know i'm going to interject right. you are we talked about it was it last week or two weeks before the four cornerstone the smart allocation of the dollars and it's just making sure that first cornerstone that you lay down of any strong foundation has to be around the risk management until you have a living estate where you've built it up where if anything then happens to you your estate is at such a point where it uh, is going to be able to maintain the standard of living you want for your survivors, great. But in the meantime, don't get into investing. Have that conversation about the first cornerstone. I, I think I, well, well said. Absolutely. And no, look, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't do that. Right. Like, if you don't want to do that, say you don't do it. If you just want to deal with investments... That's fine. I don't, by no means I'm saying if you're in the investment offering business that you have to talk about risk products. But if you hold yourself out to be a person that does planning, you have to do it. <laughs> yeah, if, if, particularly if you have a CFP behind your name or, you know, this is uh, a yeah. pet peeve. I guess you'd hit one of my emotional triggers or, you know, or you're <laughs> calling yourself a financial planner. You've have to have that conversation and then you if you Absolutely. don't want to implement on it and you want to give it over to someone else partner up but have that conversation right and they may not want to do it if they don't want to do it that again that goes back to then your standards for your clients and we'll talk about that separately but you at least have to have those two things in alignment and that kind of wraps up our whole conversation here mm -hmm. of you know delivering on that value proposition if you if you, you know, do what you say <laughs> say what you're going to do and then do it um so that really is a great spot for us to wrap up this week if you have topics or questions that you would like us to cover uh reach out to us on our twitter account at value underscore ability send us a tweet or Go to value-ability.com and click on the Contact Us tab. You can send us topics or questions that way. What is your biggest pet peeve in the financial planning industry? Go to our website, uh, submit a form, tell us what your biggest pet peeve is, and we will feature that in an upcoming episode if it's a, uh, a good pet peeve. <laughs> uh, while you're there, sign up for our mailing list, value-ability.com. Click on the Contact Us tab, and that mailing list is right there at the top. Like, review, subscribe, and share. Got to do the mantra, the beginning and the end. Wherever you find us, please, it really does help us if you uh, like and subscribe to uh, our podcast wherever you find us. Next week, White Swan, Black Swan, Why Risk is More Important Than Return in Retirement. And one of my favorite topics, uh, we will get into discussing timing risk. And then in the next few episodes, we're going to continue talking about the different risks in retirement, each uh, specifically uh, moving on then to inflation and longevity. After that, as always, thank you for listening and join us next week. And until then, remember that financial success comes from building a plan on the foundation of your values and building your ability will help you get there.
This is a podcast collaboration, not a peer-reviewed journal or a sponsored publication. We make no representations as to accuracy, completeness, correctness, suitability, or validity of any information in this podcast and will not be liable for any errors, omissions, or delays in this information or any losses, injuries, or damages arising from its display or use. All information is provided on an as-is basis. It is the listener's responsibility to verify their own facts. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this podcast. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this podcast may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this podcast. Before acting on information on this podcast, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. Assumptions are not reflective of the position of any entity other than the authors, and since we are critically thinking human beings, these views are always subject to change, revision, and rethinking at any time. Please do not hold us to them in perpetuity.